one of the things, uh, I don't have a topic today, so what I was going to do, I was thinking maybe of telling you all how to or run a TV station or something like that, but th that's okay. I, I don't really think any of you are in the market. Television is dead. Just dead. There, there's no recovery. Print media is... Everything's dead because there's one device that came out, the iPhone, and its sister device, the iPad, and then if the person doesn't have phone service, uh, the iPod Touch, which can still do phone service cheaper, like $3 a month for Skype. And they can call all the U.S. numbers they want, but they don't have a number to call in. And they can always get a Skype number for, you know, still less than a cell phone. But they just have to be connected to an IP. Or IP, excuse me, Internet source. I don't know why I said an IP. ISP is probably what I meant. So, yeah, okay, yeah, that that's interesting that someone can use an iPod Touch or or tablet or something and still make telephone calls cheaper than they would with the regular phone, but then they still have to have an ISP. And some places have an ISP for free. Whatever. What? Why is this happening? Uh, I mean, I essentially, I could do this, what I'm doing right now. I can do it on an iPhone. I just, or an iPad. I just don't want to learn how to, because I already know how on a computer. Um, maybe that's not cost-effective or frugal. Whatever. Damn, I left my cigar in the other room. Plus, I'm, I'm pretty much streamlined on the Mac. So I have the choice, like having a, a Mac or a Windows computer, and then, you know, having one of these devices is fine. But for the common person, one of these devices is extremely, extremely... Uh, effective, essential. And, um, so, what is, um, I have a flashlight, a camera with flash photo, a camcorder, a movie player, a portable movie player, a portable game system, a portable business computer with the most basic of business, a, um, a way to read novels and newspaper, browse the web, view videos on the web, create videos for the web. Um, I can essentially... Um, this isn't just the iPhone. This is smartphones in general. I can also record and make music, distribute music. So uh, that's just off the top of my head. I mean, it, it took over a lot. And right now the print media is dying. And the um, movies are definitely dying. This is, I don't really think it has anything more to do with politics than with convenience. And to, to put it correctly, it used to be that a person went out to be entertained. Now they just they can sit anywhere and become a hunchback with carpal tunnel syndrome on their phones. I don't, I don't know what's entertaining. I don't know why a person has to have constant, absolute communication to their friends or family or both. Um, I'm not that interesting. As you can tell by my terrible YouTube views. So, I I don't know. I honestly do not know um, what what is so fascinating about a lot of this stuff. But, overall, no matter what's out there, um, like, is Nintendo foolish for Switch? Uh, no, not yet. Though I do think that we're in the death throes of, of video gaming. Because this is essentially what I see in the aftermath of a system's demise. I see nothing but sports games and first-person shooters. Oh my goodness, this guy just soldered the solder to the board. I, I have another YouTube video playing while I'm talking. I just wanted to see what he was building. And, well, anyways, go to the Oddity Archive to see what he did. That's Oddity Archive. Full disclosure, I'm a, a sponsor him on Patreon. So, what, what essentially, you know, is, is the deal with television? In all honesty, what is, you know, what is it? 
Um, I don't, you know, video stores were destroyed. There's no, there's no coming back to that other than for the occasional odd store. Um, the last few times I've been in Zia Records, dead as a doornail. I don't know what it is. I see more and more movies, records, or, well, I say records, I should say music albums across uh, everything but cassette tape. Just piling up games, piling. These are games that would have disappeared instantly in the past. They're piling up. What, what's going on out there? I don't. I don't know what's going on out there, other than the world is in massive flux. Restaurants. They just read a report today at the New American dot com. Uh, and uh, full disclosure, uh, I used to email them to get clarification on news reports. Uh, I haven't done that because I don't work in the news in the newsroom anymore. So no reason to contact them about that. But but wow, um, restaurants. Uh, they have a report, a news report about restaurants dying. There's another one about Christian bookstores dying at a different website. Uh, there's a um, another one about you know people don't want to see the movies coming out. I see YouTube videos. People are tired of all these comic book movies and sequels and stuff like that. That's all contributing to something. What I don't know. Movies are an essential part, unlike video games or anything. Movies are an essential part of the human experience. No, 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 no. no. Not the technology of the movie, but the story. And what happened with movies, it's all about the machinations and not about the story. It has to be about story. Story is what's key. I've heard that from people who've been in Hollywood for a long time. It's all about the story. Can people get into the theater and see a good story? There's the Batman Lego movie. The Lego Batman movie. Okay, the Lego Batman movie. Um, overall, it, I think the movie's good for children and everything. Because it teaches the importance of family. Although, I... You know, I don't, I don't know about some other things in, in the film... It's a children's film, That's, but it does have a lot of adult jokes. And um, the story is key. And that's what I feel is missing, is a good story. So I believe the Lego Batman movie has a good story. I'm just going to use the word good on this. But with, with the video games, I'm going to say this real quick. It's not about the story. It's about the journey. And if a person wants a story, they'll read a novel. They'll watch a movie. Video games is all about play, play, play. And how much fun I can have on the journey to the completion of the story. The plot should be minimal. The best, the best plot... In all of video games, is in Double Dragon 1. Punch the girl, go rescue her. That's it. <laughs> so, that that's just my take on that. And essentially, if a game doesn't have a story, Tetris, Dr. Mario, whatever. I mean, I, I'm not talking about what's in the instruction manual. Just, you know, just stuff like that. That's good. But movies, comic books, everything has to be have a, a good story. And if the story cannot be written properly then the story cannot be accepted uh, properly. And what I mean by that is uh, the uh, parallel edit. It's not a jump cut. A jump cut is what too many you YouTubers do, and they look stupid doing it. I, it. I will thumbs down a video if it has a jump cut. I don't care how good the subject is. There's absolutely no reason for for that. You know, cut to a different scene than cut back. That's how the professionals do it. Now, parallel edit is more annoying than the jump cut. Uh, 
what the parallel edit is. And if you go on, I don't know if it's still on Hulu, but on Hulu there's something called Odyssey, the history of filmmaking or something like that. And he explains what the parallel edit is, at first praising it. But today it's a disease. i even seen it in comic books. Here's what the parallel edit is, and you usually see it in an action movie. You, the viewer. Here's how a parallel edit works. A battle scene erupts, but there's another fight amongst the heroes um, on the other side of the room. So, see a quick two-second, maybe four-second clip of the hero punch, 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 kick. Quickly cut to the other side. And another kick, kick, punch from the other character. Cut back to the original hero. And kick, punch, kick. Shoot, I sound like Master uh, Chop Chop Onion right now. And then cut back to the other one. And, you know, kick, kick, kick. And then slide the hero from the other fight. No. Poor storytelling. That shit is wrong. It was done, um, most famously, I believe it was done in The Dark Knight Rises, but it's in a lot of films. It's even in comic books. I'm sorry, can you not show me the whole fucking fight? Yeah. Show me the whole fight. I don't care about the other fight. Then you just cut back to that. Or, you know what, with widescreen technology, show with both fights. And it gives me a reason to go see the movie again in the theater. Maybe I can keep my attention to the fight on the other side. Yeah. Radical idea there I got. Show the whole fight. I don't want to see snippets of the fight. But that's because the takes are two seconds long. Yeah, a movie. A movie that's, you know, one, a 90 minutes to three hours could be set up slowly by one second here, two seconds there. Of, of cut, 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 cut. What I like about uh, Spectre is a, a lot of the action is focused on the action, though it does have the two-second cuts and stuff like that. It is an action movie after all, right? Um, I don't like Spectre overall as a film, but I like these long takes in Spectre. I do like that. That's good storytelling for those long takes. I like that. Um, the most famous long take is um, Bond is seen walking in his Day of the Dead costume goes up an elevator with a beautiful woman uh, gives her a kiss and everything and then is seen walking out onto the ledge and then he walks out onto the ledge of a couple of buildings and then finally takes aim at the building he's interested in one long take I like that in Birdman with Michael Keaton um, I understand it's not really a long take but it's cut like it when he's walking out in the street in his underwear it's, it's a good long take. And, and that's why Birdman works as a movie. That's why it, it really does, in my opinion. There's long takes in the RoboCop remake. And that's a good movie. I don't care what anyone says. A long take is like reading a good few thousand words in a novel and enjoying it. That's what it is. Every frame is 1,000 words. So... As a one second holds. Well, let's just go that the a person can either have thirty thousand or sixty thousand words, depending on you know, or, or more if they're nutty. And a long, these nice long takes need to be be given. Now, I haven't seen every movie. I'm very picky on my movies, but nice long takes is what I I suggest. And I'm a viewer. Yes, yes, I have worked on the fringes of Hollywood. This this is the absolute fringe of the fringe of the fringe. This is the Oort cloud of the Kuiper belt of the outer planets of Hollywood. But, nonetheless, as a viewer, I, I don't want to see these, these quick cuts. Two seconds, switch angle. Two seconds, switch angle. Two seconds, switch angle. Two seconds, switch angle. No, you got to see the sound graph when I said that. But yes, yes, it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. Nice, long takes to establish things. Nice, long takes during fights. doesn't have to be close up and quick. It should be, um, to a degree, I, I, have to say it, I think the first Rocky got it right. <laughs> 
Um, maybe I don't hate to say it. Maybe that gives me some some sadistic pleasure. There's a there's just um, you don't want the take to be too long as a as a film creator. So a film creator, otherwise you get something boring like the underwater scenes of Thunderball in comparison to uh, Never Say Never Again, the remake of Thunderball, where it's it's not so much uh, really a quick take or anything. It's a but it gets to the story moving. The story has to be moving. See what a story is, and this is where like a mini series can fail. But what a story is, is a long a, a, a long thing thing is the wrong word. A long narration. And we, we focus as an author, as I do, on this particular point, that particular point, and this particular point, and the moments in between. Uh, video games can, can learn a lot from Sierra, old Sierra adventure games and, and Nintendo adventure games. The moments in between that counts. Particular moments, and then these people try to form these uh, so-called fanatics, which are shortened to fans. But a fan is something I blow on my face in the summertime to keep cool. These fanatics then sit there and want to mold and and create and um, project themselves onto the characters. The point is, when you take something like Captain Kirk. Or Superman. We have not seen every waking moment. We can only uh, judge their personality from what we have seen. Unlike a co-worker where you may see four to eight hours a day, five days a week, where you can definitely judge and figure out whom, what, why, and where of this person. If you know nothing of them, you know nothing of them. That is more of a formulation of a story there than it would be from reading all the Superman comics that have ever been published and all the Superman novels and watching all the Superman movies and watching all the Superman cartoons and TV shows because what are there just snippets of life key events and, and when something gets too specific it, it's like worn remembrance I'm not downplaying the significance of War and Remembrance. It actually has a prequel. There's the Winds of War, War and Remembrance. I'll bet, using the footage that exists for both miniseries, that I can cut it down in, into three three-hour trilogies. I mean, excuse me, <laughs> three three-hour movies for a trilogy. And still have the story coherent, relevant, and fast. Um, you know, there. So that's what a story is: is the key points of a person's life. That's why people don't take a shit in a movie. Do you do you, you want to see someone? Um, let's take Last Boy Scout. There's a scene, and in, in, uh, in the beginning. Not the beginning. In the middle of the movie, um, we know that the the captain, the police captain, and uh, his lieutenant, they, he goes, I got bad news and bad news. That's that scene. Well, um, Jimmy Dix just got bounced off of a car, so we know that, that this is all happening in the morning. And... Uh, Joe Hallenbach, played by Bruce Willis, he he wakes up, and uh, we know that either well, it's football season, so either it's a three day weekend or it's a Saturday. Let's assume it's a Saturday, all right, or a Sunday. So his wife and child are sleeping in it, being the L.A. area, I don't expect them to go to church. Uh, this is just something I've seen in the L.A. area, though there are a lot of religious people in L.A. There's a lot of religious people in Las Vegas, too. So, um, he goes, he looks at his wife, who he just got having an affair with his best friend, and um, this is after he's taken a shower and everything. Then he sees his daughter, and you know, he can't believe his little girl's growing up. Someone rings his doorbell. So it must not be out of the way. So it's probably close to 9 a.m., maybe 8.30 a.m. So this doesn't surprise him. Someone's ringing his doorbell. He goes and 
well, you have to watch the movie for yourself from this point. The thing is, we know that as Jimmy Dix was getting bounced off of a car, and the two police officers have bad news and bad news, that he got up in the morning, probably scratched his bum, took a shit, took a shower, probably didn't brush his teeth, smoked a cigarette while he was on the shitter, when, you know, got dressed, prepared for a day of detectiving, and, uh, you know, went and saw his family. So, you know, that that's why you don't see people needing to take a shit or eating. He probably got a bite to eat, maybe a cup of coffee. That's where the key points comes in. The first time that was pointed out to me in, in, a, in storytelling, well, other than Mad Magazine satire that makes fun of authors and comedians and stuff like that, was I was at I was reading a review on the movie QB7. It's a it's one of the first miniseries. It has Anthony Hopkins, who plays a a Nazi doctor or something like that, and. Um, or he helped the Nazis as a doctor. And, and Ben Gazzara, who plays a Jewish author, who um, accuses him of helping the Nazis and ends up in court in London for uh, libel. Libel and slander, I believe. It's by, uh, the novel is by Leon... Uh, is it Iris? I think his last name is Iris. QB7, that's Roman numeral 7, V-I-I. QB7, you can look it up. It's on. It's available on DVD. Sometimes it's occasionally played on television. But in the review I read that someone wrote online somewhere, and this has got to be a decade since I read this review, and the person wrote that the character gets off the plane, gets in a taxi, walks through a hallway meticulously filmed and then knocks on a door and he said you know why can't we just see him you know get in a cab and then later see him knock on the door and that's correct it's the key points that count so there's no key points in between all of that it's just a waste of film now with filmmaking um, I believe that a person wants to shoot as much possible film as possible as much potential footage that could be used as possible and and that creates uh, more narrative. It's like a novel, novelist or, or a reporter or an essayist looking at what they have written and then cutting it down for the sake of pacing prosperity and the key points. Key points. Um, the other place key points are used is as a, uh, if I was a professor or an instructor of a class, high school, college, junior high, but let's let's say um, let's say uh, college. If I was a university or a college instructor on a particular class, what I do is I put key points up, and then I from those key points, my memory should be as such. Then I can acknowledge these key points, and with these key points, I'm able to narrate the story on other key points in in history. Um, if I'm talking about human history. Uh, of the Southwest United States, that's an entirely different history than the history of the United States and the Southwest. One is one is natural Darwinian selection, um, according to the criteria I'd be required to teach, while the other is manifest destiny. Yes, I can. I I, <laughs> I have enough. Uh, I have enough college in in this field that I can actually I can actually teach. But uh, that's not. I don't. I don't have a degree, and it's not fair for me to teach without that degree because other, other genuine professors, not not, not these uh, Marxist radicals, but other genuine professors, had to go through everything to earn their master's or PhD degrees. It's a little redundant there, in order to have that position to teach. So, but I do have enough. Uh, knowledge, uh, training, and research to actually be a uh, teacher 
of United States history, economics, whatever. But from experience, I can also teach you how to run a television station and stuff. Key points. You don't want to hear about everything I, I, I've done in a day at the TV station. The first day I was at the TV station, I organized photocopies of canceled checks to make sure that people were paid. And I, I did that so quickly while talking to people, other employees, that it was absolutely amazing uh, how quickly I can work. Um, after that, I, I did everything else at, at the station in the mornings. I made sure the station mostly ran smooth as butter as a privilege of the TV station. See, I'm giving you key points. I was given the hours of 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. to do whatever the hell I wanted on one of the channels. I managed two TV channels at the same time as a traffic engineer. Well, traffic engineer also meant asset acquisition, asset encoding, asset editing. So, voila, I was given this time where I aired all kinds of things, from AMV held to video game footage to a Mac doing the Apple uh, visualizer for music, uh, whatever, you name it, I aired it. Um, I aired uh, Sailor Moon from Japan. You know, um, just because I could. So it was nice to have this time to experiment with and find out what works and doesn't work with broadcast television. Today I would probably, and I have aired stuff from YouTube, but today I would probably air stuff from YouTube. And uh, it, it taught me, um, from all the key things that happened, it taught me how to not run a broadcast media station. And that's exactly why. I can comment today um, because I also have video game experience. NDA, I cannot tell you what company it is because I'm, I don't want to get anybody fired. But NDA, and um, yes, NDAs aren't enforceable in Nevada. Okay, that is true. I don't have the money to go to court to get that approved. The judge will see it in my favor, sure. Probably tell the other party you have to pay for my legal costs. How am I going to get there first if I don't spend money on my own legal costs in order to have those legal costs reimbursed. So I'm not here to violate my NDA. I don't have an NDA with the TV station. So I know how to run a um, video game company and I know how to run a, a television broadcasting company. I also know how to run restaurants. Multiple restaurants. Just some uh, after that business is business. I can run any business. But with that comes experience. A bureaucrat or a military man who had to answer for different perspectives in their particular field of operation will not have the same outlook or perspective that I would from my uh, business operations. It's just not there. Nobody's disrespecting anybody anymore in that. It's just it's two fundamentally different versions of business. At the same time, while I do know the overall essence of business, uh, that essence does not apply to, say, if I was a cattle rancher or a construction company or so forth and so on. Because there's no way I can, I can do any of this because uh, I've never done it. You, you don't want someone who doesn't have the knowledge and experience to go run this. And this is exactly what's going on right now in all of publishing business and so forth and so on is, you know, people are getting into the field who don't belong in the field. They have no critical thinking abilities whatsoever. No, and critical thinking equals problem solving. Problem solving equals solutions. Well, if we can't get people to critically think, how do we get to the other two points? Ah. That answers your question on that. So, what, what's the cure? Well, one, one cure is to draft everybody in the military, but come on. Come on. Let's, let's talk about realistic cures here. Realistic cures is everyone's going to have to fail. And once they fail, if they can learn from that failure, they'll be captains of industry. If they don't learn from that failure, they will be consumers of industry. I see it as a win-win. But if people aren't allowed to fail, then it's a lose-lose. And uh, well, that's what I, I see right now is right now we have a win-loss or a loss-win. 
uh, not not so much anyone trying to work together or like that. I mean, come on, gotta work together, right? I mean, uh, cooperation. All species cooperate. If you want to get Darwinian on it, a tiger is a solitary animal. Good for him. I'm not a tiger. Look, I gotta cooperate. I am using Audacity to record this from a microphone made by Logitech, wearing a lanyard to work as a microphone holder that was ordered and manufactured for Capcom. Okay, you see where I'm getting at here. We're interconnected that way. But people do this of choice. Capcom chose to make this lanyard, while at the same time Logitech chose to make this microphone for Activision. Ah! <laughs> The computer I'm using has a Samsung monitor. I have an Apple mouse, an Apple keyboard. I'm using a light manufactured and sold at the Cal Ranch stores. I'm using a, a shelf. I don't even know who made the shelf. I'm using building blocks made by a toy company. I'm using hard drive. Like, you see what I'm getting at here? Yes, we're interconnected. And um, at the same time, by being interconnected, we, we're allowed to have individualist tendencies to succeed. A rugged individual can succeed. A rugged, a rugged individual seeds a situation. Let's take something simple. My plant is withering. It doesn't matter who grew the plant, the pot it's in, made the soil, gave him the water hose or whatever. He works, so he took all that money. My plant is withering. The soil is dry. I will water the soil. Do you know that people who can't critically think, that's why they don't have yards? You ever notice that? If you can't critically think, you can't have a yard. They who do not critically think cannot take care of a yard. It's, it's that simple. Now, I, I don't manicure my yard, but I let it grow wild. I love a jungle. And the more wild my jungle is, the less water I have to use. See, when I was cultivating it, I had to waste two extra minutes of watering per sector. Yeah, I actually divided my yard up into quadrants and sectors and all this stuff. As it goes, I don't have to do that as much anymore because the growth creates shade from the previous year's plants. Previous year's plants are now big. Therefore, by creating shade and having their leaves fall down, I have a natural mulch. By having that natural mulch, it retains water into the soil, therefore creating warm moisture, which is what plants like. Well, I guess I could be a farmer. <laughs> um, now, in the natural world, it's not good to have mulch pile up like that. So what has to happen every so often is a fire. I don't need a fire in my yard. I can clear out the mulch if it gets to be bug-ridden. I can also create barbecue ash in a fire pit. I say that charcoal ash in a fire pit. And I can go ahead and sprinkle that out and get the same effect of the nutrients and everything. Ah, you see, that's why the natural world has to have wildfires. Not naturally set wildfires, not unnatural. Not, not set by man, but set by by the hand of God. So, then it creates this ash, and then leaves fall on this ash. And it creates really good soil. And then the sun warms it up in the summertime. The roots grow through it. Well, everything is connected like that. And that's how it works. That's the interconnection. So, that's what a rugged individualist has, is a good yard. Maybe he wants a manicured yard. Maybe he wants a wild yard, like I do. Maybe he wants a big shade tree. Maybe he wants a sunny yard. People who don't critically think don't have yards. They concrete the whole backyard. They have a desert landscaping in the front yard. They never go out there. They're never outside. Sheep, my friends. Sheep. You don't want to. You don't want these. You don't want to go to uh, advice from these people. Absolutely not. Now, there are some places on Earth where a yard is just too much work. Like in Pahrump, Nevada, the, almost every house is given uh, deep layers of type two soil. Imp 
impossible to grow anything. And if it's not type 2 soil, it's what Phil Barnes calls the prump poof. It's this lake dirt that is impossible to grow anything. So, how to get around all of this? There isn't really any way except too much hard work. But in this case, a person can go ahead and maintain a mockroom of a lawn. Start simple and work from there. And that's exactly what I've done, is I've started simple and I've worked from there. Now I have to give up this lawn in a few months' time, and I get to start anew. And, you know, there are some things I don't want to give up of the lawn, obviously, but it, it's, it is what it has to be. It is what it has to be. So, uh, I've just been texted. And, oh, there we go. Now, hold on. Let me answer this text. So, a rugged individualist. It, it has a good yard to the best of his ability um, the reason I bring up the desert yard is having lived in Pahrump and Phil lives in Pahrump it is impossible without a lot of money way too much free time to do yards in this town in Las Vegas not so Las Vegas I can get a yard already started and just work from there I've done it three times already in my life. So I can do it again. In Pahrump, I tried every day. I would spend hours upon hours outside. Hours and hours and hours outside trying to get trying to get the, the yard to go. It, it No matter what I did, unless I was willing to invest heavily, 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 there was no way, no way to do it. Uh, hold on, jeez. What part of I'm on the air no one understands? Okay. So, let me talk about doing my yard in Pahrump if I actually wanted to invest this kind of money. First and foremost, I have to go and call out somebody. Not not Snowden. That was the fence company out there. I'd have to call Tiberty from Las Vegas to come out. Do a survey of my soil and figure out how to put um, two types of walls. There's the one with the thicker brick and one with the thinner brick. These are gray, gray uh, bricks. Leave me alone! And, um... So, here's how it works. After I have their survey done, they survey my whole property line. And... I go ahead and I have them dig a trench, put rebar and concrete at the bottom of the trench, and they have to figure out how to make sure that it doesn't sink in the soil. We know that bedrock is 50 feet down. I can't afford to have an excavation 50 feet down to the bedrock and then filled with concrete, can I? Think about that for a minute. Yes, I can. That's where the money comes in. After that's done, well, we go ahead and we figure out what is the height of the house. And have three feet of concrete poured uh, as a slab around the entire perimeter of the house. This has to be done because of the type of dirt in Pahrump. And this slab obviously has to be the same uh, thickness as the foundation of the house. But it doesn't have to sit necessarily on foundation. It doesn't weigh as much as the home itself, which is supposed to be sitting on stilts or, or something. So once that goes around there, now that does limit my space. After that, a regular brick wall, preferably at anywhere from 6 to 8 feet, I'd go with 8 feet, is built, topped off with decorative 
uh, stone at the very top. But now that the concrete has settled and it has come up almost to the top, then this is where um, a uh, large tractor backhoe is brought in. Go ahead and smooth out the dirt, maybe. And a, a, um, a rather large um, thing. This drops has to be brought into the backyard as well. It drops um, this ball that compresses the dirt. So this has to be brought in. Well, this is going on. Now people are like, oh, you have to allow drainage. No. No, I don't. I actually, I checked the Nye County one. That was a myth. So if somebody's yard floods up, um, it's up to them to get the drainage. The yard, after this is, the yard is leveled and done, and uh, oh, the retaining wall is built, that's the word I was looking for, or term, uh, retaining wall, and the regular wall is built up and everything. I could be courteous, and I could allow some decorative stone to be used as, as an, a type of drainage that can go through my yard. But no, I actually do not have to allow drainage. That is completely up uh, to the person who's you know, yard is behind me. And uh, once this is done, I, I then bring in topsoil, not type 2 soil, because that would already be pounded in. So I bring in massive amounts of topsoil. And again, use the backhoe and everything to go ahead and have the soil uh, spread out evenly. Do I want a pool or anything like that? I don't know. Depends on what I'm doing. At this point, I can do anything with the yard, but I also have the retaining wall um, and a bit of a three-footer wall uh, built going around the perimeter of the house, providing an enclosure. By having that enclosure, and it goes around the whole perimeter, and then I go ahead and have an electronic gate installed. Post box or mailbox sits also on top of the wall, and then you know where the um, where the gate is allows my cars to go in and out and I have a gate as a you know pathway up to the front it also keeps out the people I don't want in the house at the same time um, I can go ahead and build a half height wall with a, with a different kind of decorative stone going around the um, the perimeter of the front yard and you know I have a wrought iron gate with um, dog fencing and stuff like that on both sides or maybe on one side I have a small gate, again, with dog fencing. On the other side I have a wrought iron double, you know, gate. Whatever. The point is it's level now, so I can do that. And have that whole area maybe concreted. So all the way up to, you know, the end of the patio. So that's all concrete, so I can use that for a variety of things. And again, um, now this isn't Pahrump. You don't, you don't know what I'm talking about, obviously, because you haven't been out to Pahrump, but you can go with what I'm going on description here. And then uh, after that, I can have a carport uh, installed to create shade. Um, I can go ahead and have a nice gutter system put in with a metal piping. Uh, then I can go ahead and I can put, um, I can either concrete it or, or since it is, it is county property, I can, I can just go ahead and have type 2 dirt uh, put over it. And then uh, I can start planting big trees and everything that grow real, real, real nicely, all, you know, quickly and fast. Put some gypsum salt down at the bottom and, you know, topsoil and put some mulch and all this stuff. The problem with everything I've just described is that it will cost 25000 to $50,000 to do. In Las Vegas, I don't have to do any of this. It already comes with the house. Or the land is good enough that this is not a problem. So, that's just something I wanted to exemplify and how rugged individualism has to have some limitations. You ever seen Magnum Force? Man's got to know his limitations. A rugged individualist knows his limitations because he works within the laws, and rules, and um, traditions found. He doesn't go out of his way to try to change anything. He works within it to keep the status quo. It's okay for society to have a long time status quo and have gradual change. There's no reason to have mutation. Mutation doesn't result in anything at all. I mean, what, what is the point of perverting and mutating society to the point where it, it's 
unfunctional. Well, think about that. Whether you agree or disagree, I don't care. It's C-O-F-F-E-E, number four, B-I-N-K-Y, coffeeforbinky at gmail.com. And I'm going to keep doing more and more of these kind of videos until I finally start making some money here while I still look for a regular job, preferably at Excalibur Circus Circus Arcade. And really, be good to each other out there. Vampire Mike says it, I say it. Be good to each other out there. Respect each other's views. Don't protest. Don't fight. Don't lie. Don't make stuff up. You know, you want to get a good guideline, follow the Ten Commandments. I mean, you know, think about it. I'm not saying be religious. I'm not saying go to church. Don't, don't, don't even go to church. Just respect people by following the guidelines in the Ten Commandments. That's it. Just respect, be good, help each other out. Someone's got a flat tire and you, you, they don't know how to change it, pull over, help them, give them a drive, follow them to the gas station, something like that. Be good to each other. You know, give no money to panhandlers because you're doing more good by making them suffer so they learn the error of their ways than it is to enable them by giving them money. You want to help them? You go down and volunteer at the soup kitchen. I would never do that. Why? Because <laughs> I'm lazy. But I have helped people. I, I seem to help people all the time. And I don't talk about it. I'm not going to share my story. Those are mine. Those are my personal pleasures, not yours. So why don't you go out? You'll feel better if you help. So be good to each other out there. 